this here. Hi, everyone. It's a honor for me to introduce Don. Uh, Don's going to talk about Azure 80. I uh, got a few minutes with him earlier, and I think that's going to be uh, very interesting. Great. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So I'm Don Mallory, um, and welcome to Unconditionally Conditional, uh, strong authentication in Microsoft Azure ID, and or now, as it's known, Entra ID. Um, who am I? I have 30 years of experience in IT, mostly in critical infrastructure. Uh, today, I'm a healthcare security professional. If you're looking for certifications, I have some. Um, you know, it's a thing. Uh, over the years, I've built, uh, mentored, or run a large number of, um, of, of InfoSec-based projects, uh, mostly to help people enhance and experience their experience and careers. Uh, or get them into, into it. And I also teach black and white darkroom techniques as a complete aside. Just a quick disclaimer, uh, the thoughts and opinions shared throughout this presentation are mine and mine alone. They are not those of my employer, pre employer's past, present, or future. We're going to move into an agenda. We're going to talk about trust and zero trust. We're going to talk about devices and apps. We're going to talk about conditional access. We're going to talk about, uh, and policies and their components, um, we're going to cover a model of, for strong authentication and what does that actually look like in this space. We're going to go through some troubleshooting aspects of it. Uh, there's a few other things that tie in with these services. And then we're going to get into licensing because it actually is very important to what you're capable of doing. There's some resources and links and then some conclusions at the end. Just a warning, you don't need to take photos of any of the... Um, the, the, the material as we're going through. Um, there is a GitHub repo that is going to be published. Uh, please wait for the QR code at the end. And that's the last QR code at the end. So there's some assumptions. Um, authentication is only one part of your defense strategy. Authentication does not just apply to users. I, it identity applies to devices, applications, services, and users. Authentication is verification of identity. Authorization will be mentioned, but will not be covered in detail. And what things will we, will we not be covering? We're not covering everything, because there's always going to be more. You always have to embrace the rate of change, especially as you're talking about cloud-based services. Pricing, that's between you and your sales rep. And how long is it going to take to implement this stuff? Well, chat, talk to your change advisory board. Everybody's going to be different. So what is trust? According to this special publication, 800161, it's a belief that an entity meets certain expectations and therefore um, can be relied upon. It's also a noun, assured reliance on character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something, or a verb, to hope or expect confidentiality. So what is zero trust? It's a principle-based model, an idea, designed with cybersecurity, within a cybersecurity strategy, that enforces, protects, a data-centric approach to continuously treat everything, so by always protecting data, uh, whether a human, a machine, or to, trust, uh, uh, to ensure trust, uh, trustworthy behaviors. But this is still all about trust. It's about developing where trust is and wh what you expect you're going to trust and what you're willing to trust as you go through this model. So why should we care? The traditional thinking, well, the physical network boundary is the edge. Firewalls are going to save us. Well, I don't, I don't know about you, but um, I've always ever always seen a firewall as just a layer in, the, in your security defense strategy because when it comes right down to it, 
Um, it doesn't really stop most attackers anyways. So when you move into a cloud-based posture, the data is the edge. The client is just a conduit to that data. Authentication is the gateway to your data. So improperly implemented, um, authentication is the same as leaving the front door. Sorry, properly, implement, properly implemented, you can um, control how your data is being accessed and where, where your users are going to be able to access it from. Uh, but making sure that your data is strongly authenticated in a cloud-based solution with data loss controls will have a real impact on physical attacks, but it moves you to an entirely new attack surface. But more importantly, we have a legal and moral and regulatory obligation to protect the data of our staff, our clients, patients, whatever it happens to be. When you move into a hybrid management architecture, your services are quite a bit different. We have on-premise, we have cloud. The Azure AD Connect, which is now Entra ID Connect, connects your cloud, cloud services to your, to your on-prem services. The cloud management gateway is critical because it connects your system center configuration manager for configuration management and compliance to Microsoft Intune in the cloud, building out endpoint, the endpoint manager solution. So when we move into devices, there's a variety of different device types that are registered inside that space. Entra registered devices or Azure regis registered devices are really only useful for BYOD. They don't really have a whole lot of other purpose. Azure AD joined are your on-prem devices. Entra joined are your cloud native devices. When you have them in both Azure AD and the cloud, they're hybrid joined. This is very important, especially if you want to have those devices operating as if the, the on-prem devices operating as if they're in the cloud or, and when they're off premise, premises. So hybrid joint um, is, is what your goal is. Then you get into co-management. So when you have it managed with SCCM and you have it managed in Intune, you're now co-managing between those services. This is quite critical to how you're going to manage your policies and compliance for those devices. We're going to move into MDM and, and MAM. MDM is mobile device management. MAM is mobile application management. Device management is device focused. Application management is application focused. These seem kind of obvious, but sometimes they aren't. Both of them have configuration policies. Both of them have compliance policies. Both of them do encryption, one at the device level, one at the application level. The application level compliance or encryption containerizes your data within the application. This is very important for how you're going to protect especially regulated data. On the device side, you can do app push, you can do OS and app updates. Um, on, the, on the application side, uh, you can do remote data wipe of your data. Um, and your users get to have, uh, sorry, on, on, uh, on the MAM side, your users download the apps from the App Store. You don't get to choose when they download. They, they get to do that on their own, which will come, become a, apparent later. You can do device wipe on the device side, application wipe on the app side, and the application wipe is only the data within the container. This is very important to separate off. So MAM is best for BOIOD, but can be layered on top of MDM. MDM policies, um, when we're talking about the, the various different policies that are available, iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac have different policy sets. Chrome OS is not supported quite yet, and nothing else is actually supported at this point. When you start looking into the uh, operating system versions that you can apply, you'll find that the min-max versions are limited to major version numbers. It doesn't really work beyond that, especially if you're talking about Android, because of the, build, the differences of build, not build values that are available for the various different OEM providers, the, uh, the, the uh, telecom providers that are providing the devices. And if you really want to try, go for it, but it, it's a losing proposition. Um, so looking at actions for non-compliance, when you have your, your device and it's not where it's supposed to be when it's, when it's in a non-compliant state, you can do a few things like you can, you can delay, or you, sorry, you can uh, delay compliance I don't know why you would de delay non-compliance. You can send users push notifications. You can send them email notifications. You can send them reminders that their email notifications haven't, they haven't done anything about it. So leading them up to a point where you then retire the device or maybe you remotely lock the, the device. Now keeping in mind that this is probably an org-owned device and you don't want to do this on somebody's personal device. 
When you get beyond those, you start getting into the, the, the applications themselves. So protected apps run inside the container. Not all apps are protected the same way. This seems obvious, but the apps inside the container are in the container. Let's be very specific about this. The apps that are outside of the container are outside of the container. So when you start looking into um, some of the, the apps in this list, you'll notice that there's some that say they're for Intune. That's not the same as the apps that are in the outside of the container. If you're just using Slack, WebEx, uh, and, uh, and Zoom, you will not be able to use those apps with data from inside the container if you separate them off properly. And this is a good thing. Uh, where are we next? So policy options on the MAM side, um, you get to control where backups are going. Uh, you get to block save, uh, saving copies of your organizational data. So you make sure that your data is where you expect it to be. Uh, you can allow protected applications to paste data in to the container, but you can also make it so that data can't be pasted out of the container. This is very critical because especially if we're talking about being, using these services on a bring your own device, personal device type situation, and you're using regulated data, you don't want that data outside of the container, you don't want it dropped to the main device, because again, you've now lost control of your regulated data. I w in, it, throughout my career, most of the data that I've worked with has been regulated in some way. I don't want my device on anybody's personal machine, not ever. And if it's on a personal machine, I'd better be able to either wipe the machine, because I've been given privileges to do so, or I need to be able to have a way of making that, that data unusable in some other fashion. So when we want to move into third-party keyboards, I missed it. Uh, there we go. Third-party keyboards is at the bottom. You don't want third-party keyboards uh, to be allowed on most devices because of the fact that as you're when you're, when you're using a keyboard, what, what do you type into that? You type in your username, you type in your password, you type in all of your personal information. If you have a third-party keyboard that's in use, that third-party keyboard is likely leaking that data to a third party of some form that you don't have control over. So you can encrypt the data uh, within the container. Remember, this is against the container only. Uh, don't allow native apps. Notifications. You might want to allow that because you still want the users to be able to actually see their notifications when they're operating. Pin types, um, if you block, alpha, block numeric pins and you let, force your users to use alphanumeric pins, they're not going to like you very much, but they will like you if you allow them to use biometrics. And forcing pin reset, resets is just a way to make people use weaker and weaker passwords over t or, or pins over time. So when we move past that, we're now looking at um, everything is in the container, right? We still remember that? Okay. So the goal is to protect the company data. And, oops. Th so this is where conditional access, uh, conditional launch policies apply, when things aren't working as they're expected. So maximum pin attempts, you hit five, okay, force them to reset the pin. Um, if the phone is lost or stolen, it's 720 hour, hours passes, block access to the data. The device is offline. They don't need access to the data. They now have to, how, they now have to re authenticate to get access again. After 90 days, you know what? Wipe the, the org data because we don't really want them touching that anymore. Now, what about if you're talking about um, a disabled account? Well, maybe you should block access to the data. Jailbroken device, block access to the data. Wrong pin again, um, force a pin, so we talked about forcing pin resets. Uh, minimum OS versions, um, you get into a warning threshold levels and you can then force uh, updates beyond a certain point. So limitations within Intune. Uh, privacy and troubleshooting is a bit of a pain. Uh, Entra ID on will only show you the, uh, the OS, the, the device name and the, uh, the, the device um, uh, operating system, and that's it. So this is great for privacy for your users. This is absolutely horrible and garbage for troubleshooting. Policy and reporting is inconsistent. The compliance policies are usually well reported, sort of, uh, but the best report that you can use is one that does per, uh, per setting failures, which can be quite helpful in narrowing down which policies are failing. Um, config manager. 
The config manager policy management is going away within quarter, at the end of quarter one of 2024, so no point in looking for compliance from config manager anymore. That's just a waste of time. Uh, hybrid joined is, and co-managed is tricky and takes some time. So you need to make sure that your GPO is set up properly, ADFS is working properly, that you're working closely with your SECM team to make sure that that stuff is working properly, and config manager clients must be up to date on all of your endpoints. Uh, config man cloud management gateway has cost, especially if you're pushing uh, services and apps to your users. And policy filters are a bit of an art. When you get into iOS and Mac, if you want to have full MDM management of those, you have to have data, the device enrollment program set up. Otherwise, you don't get visibility of what the apps are beyond the apps that you pushed from within Intune, which you know, might be a problem for you. Um, config policies. So on a Mac, if you decide to apply compliance policies and you, say, force people to have a password that's eight characters, um, a simple password, and uh, they have to reset it once every 365 days, what you'll do is you'll brick their device. Within about an hour, all of a sudden, the device will sit there and say, I can't find a password, the password doesn't work, and the user changes the password, and then it sits there locked out, and they're done. And there's absolutely nothing you can do except wipe the device, because they can't get in, because the password that they have doesn't work anymore, and they end up in a bit of a circular argument. So what you have to do instead is you apply configuration policies before you apply compliance policies. Compliance is for validating configuration, not the other way around, at least in iOS and Mac. It tends to be more of a problem on the Mac than it does on iOS. Um, so let's move into conditional access. Uh, there's a variety of signals. Who, who you are, what, what, you're, what you're coming in from, where you're, where you're doing it from, how are you authenticating, um, what your sign-in risk is based on your behaviors and, that, uh, and, experience, and where you're, uh, which IPs you're coming from, that sort of thing. There's a decision that tends to be made. Do you allow, do you deny, do you limit access based on those signals? Then you monitor and assess. Do we have continuous access evaluation of the user? Has, has the behavior changed? Uh, has the user been lo account been uh, denied access? Is there a forced reset on that? Let's change their access. So conditional access allows you to layer all of these controls so far around, um, around your data based on signals that you define. And they're cent it's central to a data-centric cent data strat security strategy. It provides you with just-in-time evaluation to ensure that the person who is seeking access to the content uh, is authorized to access that content at that point in time. So when we start moving into policies themselves, there's a whole bunch of options. And yes, we're going to walk through the interface because there's a bunch of nuance in here. Um, so in users, you have all or none, you have guests, you have special types of guests that you can apply this to. You, can, you have uh, different roles, that, sorry, uh, you have different roles and different role groups, so a global administrator, global reader, privileged role admins, those types of things. So you can apply different policies based on which roles people are on. Keep in mind that exclusions are always important with these environments, because anything that you need to have in a different policy, you need to exclude from an earlier layered policy. And especially if you're going to be doing testing, you're going to need to do that as well. But more importantly, that break glass account you need to make sure that there's a break glass account because I guarantee that you're going to lock yourself out of your policies at some point and you won't be able to get back into the tenant. Everybody does it at least once. Uh, so plan for that. Target resources, applications. We have apps. You can select them. Anywhere that there happens to be a little eye beside it, like the Office 365 one, guess what? It's got a ton of other options and there's a humongous list of apps that are tied in with that. They are not always obvious. They are not always straightforward. And when you think you have all the components, you will not always have those components. Um, restricting admin access is very critical. So you want to make sure that your, your admins can only do the admin things from locations that you want your admins to work from. Microsoft just recently added the MS Admins portal, which makes this, uh, portals as an app, which makes this a lot easier. Um, and there's a few things that will require all apps, and the interface will warn you. Actions. So registering security information. Um, we talked about earlier this morning, uh, Alex had a, converse, had a presentation on, uh, on, on abusing access controls. And one of the things that he happened to mention was that if you can 
get into the middle of that, that interaction, that you would be able to use that as a takeover opportunity. This is very critical, especially when you're talking about registering your security information. So that's registering where your MFA is being registered from or changing your password from. If you allow that from an untrusted location and say you've gone and synchronized, oh, I don't know, 16,000 accounts to your Active Directory, your Azure Active Directory because you are just about to move all of those users into a live environment and you wanted to have, to have those users in the global address list, well, we all know that users will reuse passwords at some point in time because we've all done it at some point in time. And at that point, point, you end up in this kind of little funny problem of the first person who gets the auth gets to register the MFA, and they now own that account. So maybe you should only let your users register their MFA from on-prem IPs. Maybe they have to come on site. That might be really important for you. Now, in my case, I work at a hospital service, so that's pretty easy. The vast majority of my users will come on site at some point in time. Um, they're not going to like it but you can provide your help desk with a way to work around that. So another piece, interesting. Um, so another piece within there was uh, registration and, and device join. That's the same sort of situation. If you're talking about device registration, it's, it, you're going to trust that device. Well, it's no different than trusting your MFA token. Do you want to trust your device that was registered from, I don't know, uh, a beach in Maui? Maybe, if, that, if you have an office in Maui, but I don't, so I probably wouldn't trust registering a device from a beach in Maui. Uh, nothing wrong with Maui, it's a wonderful place, but uh, my, my users aren't going to be working from there on a daily basis. Uh, authentication context is another option. So this is actually kind of cool because you can apply specific um, matched criteria within conditional access to a particular context and then you can use that context to apply that to a variety of different situations, whether that's in data loss prevention policies against sensitivity labels um, or something like PIM, and you can say, it, or even within a specific application. So if you had an application that you wanted to escalate to admin privileges on, you've created a web app, your users are using it externally, you've, pr you've given access externally, the web app can be forced to, to use, say, a FIDO2 token for your administrators to escalate to that privilege just within that, that component of that application. And then there's a new function called Global Secure Access. It's very brand new. Uh, basically, it's cloud-based network filters, uh, Zscaler, that sort of product-y-like thing. Um, so conditions. So we have user risk, high, medium, low. Uh, it's risk-based signals based on the, ac the account, password breaches, password spray, uh, and misuse. You have device sign-in risk, or the, sorry, the, the specific sign-in risk, which is based on unfamiliar locations or IP addresses, malicious IP addresses or known malicious IP addresses. Device platforms, yes, that, there's Windows Phone on that. You should block that. Um, client applications. So we have the above the line and below the line, the legacy one, the modern ones and the legacy ones. You, you want to block all the legacy ones. Uh, but modern versus browser mobile devices, they're different. They're going to apply to different clients. You're going to have different services. Uh, when you start getting into things like ActiveSync, great way to get owned. Um, other clients, that's right, SMTP and POP3, say it with me now, unencrypted, weak, and likely to get breached. So locations. We all know lo location is you know, the center of everything when you're talking about access to services, especially critical ones. Uh, you want, I, find, I find that the trusted locations has no value because I would rather be specific about the, th the things that I want people to be accessing things from. When you start getting into locations, it's um, countries by geo, location by IP. Um, that you can also do location by authenticator coordinates. So that one is kind of funny because if you are doing that, then the user will get a prompt saying that they're going to share their location information with authenticator when they go to do, when they do their authentications which they may or may not be happy about, but it might also not be legal depending on where they're logging in from for you to be gathering that information. So check with your privacy and legal teams before you implement that. Device filters are uh, really awesome. Uh, they are super powerful, and there's a whole lot of legacy naming stuck in here. So anything that you see that says server AD means domain joined. Azure AD means enter joined. Um, 
One limitation, these only apply to Intune MDM managed devices, which means back to that co-management, you have to have a co-managed device that's for your hybrid join devices that are being managed on the Intune side. You see where these are starting to come together again. Why would this be important? Well, say you have a vendor, and that vendor um, is connecting over VPN on a regular basis. And you know, say that vendor likes to use their Windows 7 workstation because they just didn't feel like upgrading it, and they feel there's no real need because they're really only doing a couple of things from it. I, I don't know about you, but I don't want my vendors connecting over VPN to my services on Windows 7. And when you're looking at something like that, you're thinking, okay, well, that's probably fine. I'll just add in operating system and it equals Windows, you know, below Windows 10 something, and I'm just gonna block all of those. Well, you can't, because you haven't enrolled your vendor's laptop in your MDM, and now you're back to that situation of, oops, so how do I do that? The only play for, place for you to do that is to apply it within, any poly, within the VPN client itself and any controls that you can apply there. Um, and that's an example of the, uh, what the filters look like from when, you're, when you're making a more complex filter. Uh, and exclusions, once again, apply and are very important here. So, session controls. Um, app enforced restrictions only apply to Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, and Office 365. Uh, this also applies to sensitivity label controls. Conditional access um, app control relates to browser-related access. So, this is where you can block downloads or monitor that somebody is downloading, but only in the browser, not in the app. This is important because if you have access to the app, you can download files. Uh, of course, that doesn't stop anybody from doing screenshots, but you know you have to take your wins where you can get them. Uh, conditional uh, sorry, uh, sign in frequency is not an activity timeout. Sign in frequency is a, a definitive value, so uh, you have to make sure that as you're, you're when you're looking at this that you don't overburden your users. A two-hour sign-out is two hours, exactly. You signed in, two hours later, you get another sign-in, two hours later, you get another sign-in. You don't sign in for four hours, no problem, you start your two-hour time in time at whatever the next time is. Um, continuous access evaluation primarily looks for things like token expiration changes uh, criti and critical changes to the account, like uh, user accounts disabled, MFA's been revoked, um, or it's been enabled on an account, high-risk sign-ins have been applied. Uh, you can do... Um, strict access locations, test that very carefully. Resilience defaults is really important. You want to disable resilience defaults. Um, earlier this morning, there was a talk, uh, that, uh, during Alex's talk, he mentioned that one of the, the ways to get your, uh, to take over a user's account is to um, interact with the, the, the user through a, a evil proxy or another you know, phishing interaction of some form where you can grab the, the person's session ID this actually stops that to a large degree, not perfectly, it is part of it. So what that will do is as the user's IP changes, the token dies, the session token dies. So if you logged in from you know, a particular IP, you're authenticated, you're working, you're doing your stuff, and someone else goes and logs in using that same session token from another IP, their session dies, your di yours doesn't, you don't even notice. And you don't care, because we want that. Um, Recently, they added token protection as a, an additional sign-in option. Um, it's very new. It's got a lot of limitations. Uh, honestly, I haven't tested it. So, uh, controls, block and grant, uh, those are pretty straightforward. Require multi-factor authentication is actually a deprecated control because the preference now is that you move towards um, authentication strengths. So, with authentication strengths, you will define which authenticators you're going to allow for your users. Uh, and then we're going to have a quick sidebar into what are the authentication methods available. You can define various different aspects of which ones are allowed, and yes, SMS is allowed in the environment. Why? Because it ties to self-service password reset. So if you have a valid authenticator, MS authenticator push and an SMS um, response, that might actually be valid for your environment to do a password change on that user or a password reset. Uh, let's see, where are we? So, going back to some deprecated controls, uh, require multi-factor auth we talked about, uh, approved client app is now deprecated as well. Um, compliance, so device compliance, is MDM related and requires an intra-join. 
which all, or a hybrid join. Um, hybrid, the app protection policy, anything that says app protection policy means mobile application management. So you now see how this is tying in with the things earlier on. Um, terms of use, you can ask, ask your users to accept terms of use. Your privacy policies require password change is pretty straightforward. And so limitations, there's lots of limitations in the interface. And the nice thing is, is that it, the interface will tell you all the time that you're doing it wrong and you don't know what you're doing. And then sometimes it will just gray out interface sections and you'll be wondering, what is it that's happening here? What did I miss? And you'll have to fiddle around to figure out what it is that you actually missed in the interface for that particular day. Because remember that Microsoft changes this stuff almost daily. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about is Teams. So the Teams architecture is massive. It touches pretty much everything. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is because anything that is in Teams covers SharePoint Online, Exchange Online, uh, OneDrive Online, all of the Teams messaging, all of those pieces all together in one gigantic space. So when it's inside the protected application container, you've got your content there. But sometimes Microsoft will sort of accidentally add a component that does extra logging and escapes the container, which is really awesome, especially when your users all of a sudden find out that their BYOD device that they're using with a mobile application management policy is now hitting an MB MDM policy, and the MDM policy wants them to register an Intune company portal so that they can be fully managed devices. It's a bit of a challenge. So you have to really watch these components, but Microsoft, from a support perspective, will keep leading you back to, well, you just need to allow all the users access to all apps and just use a single policy for everything, and this is not a way to operate. So there's lots of stuff here for, so far. Uh, when we start looking at all of this, that's okay, because there's some templates. If you would rather use templates to deploy, go for it. There's also JSON formatted imports, also good. And uh, you can just use PowerShell. So, is everybody with me so far? I got some nods, this is good. So let's put it all together. Exclusion versus inclusion is important uh, because it's, we're trying to, uh, to layer these policies throughout. Uh, wide policies are better for session settings, but narrow policies are better for ease of troubleshooting, targeting a specific issue, uh, OS specific policies uh, apply to a particular user base. So what, what's your user base? Is your user base all Macs or are they all Windows? If they're all Windows, why are you allowing Macs to have access to your stuff? Maybe they shouldn't be there. Or maybe you should just say they only allow, they're only allowed access to uh, web-based services because they're not trusted and you can't control them and your data is not where you want it to be. So uh, browser versus app, you can separate those policies and you'll want to because there are differences. So something, some settings that don't, some settings will not work on top of one another. So if you're in a browser policy, a setting that's there may not work in the application policy and vice versa. Uh, so consider where your users are going to be working. Those are going to be important. Trusted versus untrusted devices, locations, and user types are also important. So then we have some special use cases. Uh, device enrollment, security info registration we talked about, and admin users. Things that never sh should never happen, there are some of those, and you can watch for those. So locations, we have our corporate internal network. We can set some in internal ranges. Privileged access workstations. If you want your admins to work from somewhere, they should be working from your privileged access workstations. You can specify a small specific subnet. And since Microsoft wants you to remove your proxies from your interaction with their services, you actually expose all your internal IP, sub IP ranges to Microsoft directly, which can be very helpful because then you actually get that in your sign-in logs and you can have this stuff actually apply. Regional locations is appropriate. Some untrusted IPs, maybe your IOCs, whatever block lists you're using, some untrusted geos. Uh, the Canadian government has a, a nice sanction list that you can start as a starting place for countries that maybe you don't want people to be because it might not actually be legal for your staff to work from there. Um, and then allowed international. You might actually have staff that need to be international or they're approved to be working internationally. So what does this all look like when you put it together? Yeah, try and read that. Um, this is part of the stuff that I've shared in GitHub and you can have access to at the end. There's also a flow diagram. The flow diagram covers what does that look like from a user and troubleshooting experience. Yes, there are a lot of policies. So things to block. We're gonna block global apps uh, for, uh, for guest users, excluding Office 365. We're going to block all our high-risk admin tools except from the privilege access workstations. That means that if they're not in that one, one IP range, no working. 
there's, there's no access to admin tools from, from you know, the beach in Maui. You don't need to be doing administration from there unless you're in there with a controlled context that got you there. Legacy auth, we talked about blocking those. Linux apps, we can't control the Linux apps. We're not going to allow them. Mac apps, if it's not enrolled in your device management policies, you aren't block it, you aren't allowed that there. So again, in my environment, we block those. Windows Phone, we talked about. Um, so Windows apps on an unmanaged device. Well, again, remember that if, it's, if you have the app, you can download the data. And if I can download the data, I control the data, but it's on a device you don't trust. So don't allow that. Mobile browsers. Why would you block Exchange Online and SharePoint Online for mobile browsers? And the answer is because there's an app for that. If you can force the data to be inside of the application, then you can be sure that you have control over that data because you can wipe the data in the app, but you can't wipe the data on the browser. So keep that data in there. Security regi registration restrictions, so we talked about those earlier. Uh, block those from off-prem. Just make them come to you. Make sure that they're going to a place that you trust before you're registering the, their MFA the first time, especially. Unknown or unsupported device platforms. So um, there's an interesting situation that you can come across where, say, it's not Windows, Linux, um, Windows Phone, Android, iOS. It's none of those. It's nothing. Would you really want one of those operating systems to have access to your services? Probably not. So um, untrusted locations, there's two ways to look at this. There's an exclude, which is everybody is allowed to these, access, these locations except for, and, and you're, so everything is blocked except for these locations. So I know that our offices are in Canada. Great, you can get to Canada, but you can't get to everybody else. And you have to do this as an exclude because it's weird. Um, you can go the other way around as an include. Here's the list of countries on that sanction list block those directly, no matter what. The reason you want this policy is because when you go to the point where you're allowing people in for international access, those sanctioned countries aren't going to be allowed to be accessible from those locations anyway, so they layer on top of one another. Session policies, uh, ad admin MFA and sign-in frequency. You're gonna have a, sh a shorter admin, uh, sorry, you're going to have a shorter sign-in frequency for your admins, and you're always going to require MFA for them. They're not going to like you very much for it if you have you know, a really short frequency, so you know, try not to burden them too much. They, your admins have a lot of other things that are on their plate as well. Um, and this isn't about hampering people's ability to work, this is about protecting your data and your access to services. Uh, browser persistence. Nobody needs browser persistence. If you close a browser and you open a browser, you should log it back into the, inf the, the infrastructure again. The tokens should be dead. Start from scratch. Um, for single sign-on, guess what? This doesn't matter because the tokens all come from your single sign-on in, 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 um, environment, so it doesn't matter at all. Uh, session policies on uh, limiting downloads. So if you are coming from an untrusted device, no downloads for you if you're coming from a browser. Just don't. Now, there's an interesting side problem that happens with that, that you actually have to tell your users that they have to enable PDF auto downloads within their browser, or it won't render the PDF inside the browser, which I don't understand, but it does. MDM enrollment, obviously you want to control where that's happening from, and that they're using MFA before they do an MDM enrollment. Terms of use is a, is a session policy. Sign in risk, we talked about that. So high risk, block it. Medium risk or low risk, MFA. User risk, if the user risk gets to high, force them to change a password. If it's medium or low, MFA. So some allow policies. So in, in a healthcare situation, you get into this really weird situation where you've got all these users that are coming in and they're doing all of these things. Now, some of the places that I've worked in the past, you know, there's guards with guns and giant fences and razor wire and all of those other things. So you don't really have quite the same problem with people just now just coming on site unless it happens to be like an incursion or something. So when you're talking about a hospital, the public is there because those are your clients and they're going to be everywhere all the time. So instead of handling things with the assumption that there's trust about who's going to be on the site, you have things like NAC and EDR and group policy and configuration management and centralized patching and segmented networks and reporting on all of those systems and firewall security zones to make sure that you're segmenting off you know, various different riskier components from one another. 
So we try and build as much trust into those physical assets as possible, knowing that they're always going to be in the presence of an adversary. So in the case of an on-prem user, both Windows apps and browser, well, those are encrypted devices that are under control, that have all of these other controls on them. Yeah, you can download data there, because I can remotely wipe it, and I can remotely lock it. Uh, and in these cases as well, it might be okay for you to have a seven-day time in free, a sign out frequency, a sign in frequency, because, well, frankly, every single time the user types their username and password on the on the keyboard, they're going to authenticate to the device against your Active Directory anyway. So a single sign-on is going to apply, and does it really matter anymore that I'm forcing the user to have a seven-day sign-in frequency or longer? Um, you know, be reasonable. So. For those with allowed international access, we talked about that's the policy. Um, allowing guest access, uh, you might, if your environment does that, uh, cool. Uh, then make sure that you apply the controls that you want there. Granting MFA for VPN, as we talked about, you'll apply the VPN controls at the VPN client. You won't be applying them here, but you will want to make sure that they have a nice short sign in frequency and you might be limiting locations. So off premises. This is where we start to get into these interesting situations about what about all of those other devices. So no matter what, everyone gets MFA, no exceptions. Resilience defaults are disabled, no exceptions. Reducing the token replay attacks. We're gonna start off with untrusted devices and move from there. So with mobile apps, so this is Android and iOS only. Um, it, mobile apps applies to Office 365 and excludes Exchange Online. Uh, you're going to allow for a seven-day sign-in frequency. It's not that big of a deal because it's still in that container and all of those other policies and compliance policies and changes apply for continuous access evaluation. When you get into mobile Outlook, you're going to want a 30-day timeout frequency. Why? Well, mobile Outlook is kind of funny in that it doesn't send you notifications if it si finishes the sign-out. So now your users are not getting their notifications and it's not like we use our mail to get important notifications for anything. Uh, teams, on the other hand, will actually send you the notification and then force you to sign in afterwards, so at least you know that the notification came, as opposed to being sitting there going, I'm on call and I haven't had any calls for the last three days. Why does that happen? Oh, I forgot to sign in on my phone. That's bad. So non-MAM mobile apps. This is the policy that grabs things and forces them into MDM. So when something escapes that MAM container, it ends up in the MDM space. That's the policy for it. Uh, Mac, and, Mac and Linux um, and Windows browsers on untrusted devices, short sign-in frequency, requires MFA, no downloads. We, all, we talked about those before. Uh, trusted devices. So Windows, uh, Windows browsers on uh, Azure AD, so now Entra ID joined and hybrid Entra joined. Uh, if those devices are, are compliant, they've got encryption, they've got all those tools, you, you know, gone through all of these things to make sure that they're working the way that you expect them to, you know what, that's okay. You can download files there because I can remotely wipe your device and I can remotely lock the, the device. And I might be enforcing that my EDR is deployed to that device. So full apps are allowed, go to town. Um, and you'll have to pick an appropriate sign-in frequency, maybe three days, maybe not. Um, but keep in mind that every single time the user logs into that device, if it's connected to the internet, it actually registers a Windows sign-in in the logs, and it's authenticating, showing that the device is hybrid joined compliant, um, and which operating system it's, and that it's part of your domain. Uh, so some exclude policies. Um, blocking security, so when we talked about all of those other things early on, early, earlier on, there's always going to be situations where you're going to want to exclude. So registration restrictions, you might, not, you might want to exclude a user from that temporarily. But if you do, you'd better have uh, these, these areas monitored very heavily. Um, so have your SIM alerting on whether or not people have been added to these groups or if they've been removed, and perhaps auto-remove people from the groups that are associated. Uh, Off-prem users using mobile browsers, maybe there's a situation. I've never seen one yet. Um, Windows apps on an unmanaged, again, maybe there's a situation, but I still haven't seen it. And anything used as testing, you're going to need to exclude stuff from your policies. So when we talked about that situation where what happens when somebody logs in with an OS that isn't an OS and that hasn't identified their device and it's not compliant and it's not hyper-joined and it's not anything else, well, 
this is a real event. Um, you'll notice that there are three policies that it alerted on and failed. The first policy was that blocked and unknown and unsupported policy. Um, so no operating system. The second one was Mi Microsoft catching it as a sign-in risk of medium. So great, it got forced, to, the, for, the, the attacker got forced to use MFA, which is wonderful, but that was actually the next day. That wasn't the day that the policy actually hit the first time. I'm showing you the second day. So the third hit was high risk admin tools being caught. So two policies that we've created have actually caused an attacker not to be able to get into the environment because they were trying to use the Azure CLI uh, via a rich client from an, an unknown operating system. And there's always more. Um, troubleshooting, the coverage things have a whole bunch of extra things that you can dig through about where your coverage is for which policies are applying to which users and that sort of stuff. Um, the troubleshooting insights panel is wonderful, especially for looking at policies you're testing. You can view report only policies and whether or not they're succeeding or failing. Um, when you're looking at the monitoring policies, that pink blob at the top, that's business to business collaboration because I don't, con I, so somebody else has trusted our environment and said, we trust your authenticator, um, but they haven't applied any controls against it, but I don't get to see who is authenticating I only get to see their, 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 uh, their tenant ID from the business to business link, but I have nowhere to look it up. So I can't even tell you who's gone and trusted my environment, which is just not cool. Um, you can dump all of these to CSV VM files and start grepping. We talked about authentication context. So privileged identity management allows you to do escalations of your users. So if you have a, somebody that has a global admin or other priv privileged role, you can apply that that user is allowed to escalate or de-escalate privileges at any point in time throughout their day. You can apply limits to that. So you can say you have to have this, your global admin access approved by a third party approver. So there's, there might be a group of people that's allowed to approve global admin use. You can spe specify what the limits around that are. You can also, with that authentication context, force them to use a FIDO2 token against a specific location off of a privileged access workstation. So this starts to tie in really well with how are you going to control where your, your administrators are operating from and whether or not those services in particular can be used by an attacker from who's taken over that user's account, fished them, got their credentials, is working from wherever it happens to be, Toronto, um, and they now can't use that credential because when they go to escalate, pops up for a FIDO2 authentication. Now, getting FIDO2 to work is a bit of a trick for AD joined machines because there's group policies and there's extensions for your Active Directory schema that have to be added. So it's not quite straightforward. Sensitivity labels. This is where you're doing data classification. You can apply which controls based on those authentication contexts to your data. So say you happen to work at, I don't know, a hospital and your users are coming from offsite. Great, you've decided that they, you don't want your users to come up from offsite from an untrusted device to be able to access PHI because they're on an untrusted device. And you know what, maybe I don't even want them accessing that device, data on an untrusted device. I want them on a trusted device. So instead of just applying those controls against all data and authenticating, you can say, you can only do that for PHI. Data loss prevention, all of these things tie back together with the sensitivity labels and stuff. So we're, now we're on to licensing. There's a few little blobs in here. These apply across a bunch of different licenses. Um, I'm not going to go really deep in this, but basically if you don't have an, an enterprise mobility and security E3, F3, or A3 license, and your base E3, A3, or F3 license, you're probably not going to be using most of this functionality. So you need to go talk to your sales rep. PIM requires F5, any of the uh, five level licenses, or at least the E5 security. Uh, and some of them are under the E5 compliance moniker as well. Now, clear as mud, right? Because like, I, I don't know about you, but I, every time I look at this, I think, oh my God, that's a lot of licenses. It ends up that this is a, a tool called M365 Maps. Uh, it's free online. It's published on a semi-regular basis. This last one was from uh, July. Um, everything in here is clickable. You can dig through all of the licenses and components and figure out what they all are, and there's a huge, gigantic Venn diagrams of it, so it's helpful. So what did we learn? Authentication starts with devices, 
clients, and apps. Devices are hybrid joined for hybrid orgs or intra joined for cloud native orgs. Registering is only important for, um, is only for your bring your own device and, mo and mobile devices. Uh, we want to require compliance. MDM policy is for devices, but you want to layer MAM where possible for applications. User authentication methods matter. Uh, things can change at least quarterly, so you should review these things at least quarterly. Licenses are important, and so are your logs. There's a whole ton of resources and links. Again, all of this is going to be at the, uh, in, in the QR code at the end. Uh, Two that I want to point out, the Australian government put together a really nice blueprint. Uh, this one is actually kind of awesome because it layers a whole bunch of things together and gives you an entire blueprint of what does um, a controlled environment look like. Um, this stuff is not based on that. Th this is just part of the larger pieces that go along with deploying these services. Uh, and the CISA secure configuration base is great. Seriously, read it. It breaks it down by different components within the entire stack. Um, it's up to date on a very regular basis. Uh, the, the Australian government one is about a year behind, and I don't think that they're going to be updating it, so you know, it'll, it'll lag more uh, over time. But the CISA standard is great. It's just, I can't say enough about it. So, questions? Anybody? Nothing. I burned you all out. <laughs> going once, going twice. Is everybody activating the QR codes? Come on, somebody, go on, activate the QR code. They're thinking about it. Um, so thank you very much. This is the actual QR code that is safe. <laughs> um, th my uh, contact information is in the slide. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. The, the link at the very bottom is also the active link. Uh, and I will be publishing that just after the talk.